All right, we are live from the Carnival Miracle. <laughs> this is an, a breakthrough moment for the Digital Healthcare Podcast. Um, so yes, this is a special guest, extra special in fact. Um, Steve Hunt works at IMED. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit, but he also happens to be my uncle and we're on a family vacation. We thought what better way to supplement the cruise than to record a podcast while we do this. Um, so Steve, thanks a lot for coming. Appreciate it. Oh, I, I appreciate you having me. And um, so let's get into it. So IMED, uh, give actually give the full name because I don't I don't actually know it besides IMED. Well, it's IMED Software Corporation is the company name, but we kind of use the moniker IMED Core as our branding theme to say we have a core of really smart people and really smart technology. Gotcha. And then and so you're based in Louisiana. Uh, that's home base. We are, and we've been uh, we we were founded in two thousand and one, so we've been doing this pretty close to twenty years now at this point. Okay, and explain a little bit about the business. Well, what we what we do natively is uh, is electronic health records for the ambulatory or office based physician practice. So the majority of our customer base are private practices, and they span all of primary care as well as most specialties. But we focus primarily on the smaller clinics, one, two, three, five doctors, you know, per location. Gotcha. And then, so you're producing software, though, right? Yes. Uh, the... our, our technology is uh, developed here, you know, internally in the company. And it's a full medical charting, medical record software package. And then we augment that with, of course, tr standard support services. Hey, I got a problem. What do I do? But we also bundle in what we care pra we call practice care services, which is designed to really allow the customer to leverage the technology to create efficiency, not only in the clinic workflows, but also in regard to the patient experience. And then, and you started this from scratch, right? So yeah, it was a it was a very very bootstrap kind of very little funding and the company has operated that way you know using revenues to fund R&D and everything else it's been pretty much debt free and profitable for its entire history and talk a little bit about the origin i want to get glenn on at some point cuz it's a pretty powerful story he's got but give a little bit of background about how it originated okay so glenn has a daughter i guess she's about 23 or 24 now that was born with spina bifida so that's a disease that when you're young requires a lot of medical attention. I think he told me at one point she had 23 surgeries before she was age two. So he had to navigate a very large healthcare system. And, you know, again, that was back in the, I guess, the late 90s. And it was 100% paper-based. And he was extremely frustrated because, you know, he had to go across a variety of specialties and into different facilities. And there was never any consistency of the medical record. So he found himself telling the doctors what the last situation was and what her latest tests were and so forth. So he said, there's got to be a better way. At the time, he was doing some technology, kind of some website e-commerce development. So he transitioned the business to create an uh, electronic medical record company. And again, this was before a lot of the government you know, programs that kind of helped stimulate the transition to digital records. But so he went out and a few doctors said, yeah, let's give it a try. And it just kind of grew from there. And at that point, there wasn't these big, large corporations that were doing this? Well, for the most part at that time, and that, that was before I joined the company, for, but at that time there was a, a lot, some technology on the revenue side, you know, how to, how to get paid for what the services you do, but generally it was paper-based in terms of the medical records themselves. The business kind of took a change, the industry, I should say, took a change in 2011, or 2000, I guess it was 2011, when the high tech high tech act created the what is generally called the meaningful use program which was about 36 billion dollars of incentive money for doctors and health systems to transition to electronic records so that created a big influx of vendors both large and small into the space is there any other thing looking at the past 
for a bit longer. Is there any other highlights or and how the company's evolved or some of the challenges that you've overcome that stand out? Well, you know, I think one of the biggest evolutions was to migrate the software itself from a, you know, a client server type environment to a, a web based or browser based system completely. So that kind of really freed up how the technology could be delivered in terms of uh, not only general infrastructure needed, but also in terms of the, the fluidity or the rapidity which with, with which you could, uh, you know, release new software. So that was a that was a big thing. And again, the, I think the other evolutionary points were, as I said, in 2011, the providers realized there was a lot of money, you know, to be had by making the transition. But they're so regulatory and compliance oriented that it was really a matter of saying, OK, what do I need to do to pass the test to get my incentive? So there was a lot of focus on just data entry for several years, you know, put the blood pressure here and put the, you know, the, the smoking status over there. So we're only now seeing the evolution to where, and it's really been whatever, six or eight years, this is now the, the first time in the last year or so when, this, when the focus is shifting to, well, how can we use this technology and how can we use the data to actually enhance care? And, and is the, what would you, it, but apart from the regulatory drivers, I assume there were some other drivers that kind of pushed the industry or the sector in the direction I met has gone? Well, that's, that's actually a good question, but it's it's interesting because I think there's been some technological advances. Like I said, the, you know, the ubiquitousness of the Internet and so forth has made more technology options available. And we've been using that as a big driver for our path forward. But I got to be honest with you, from the customer perspective, a lot of it, even to this day, is very compliance, at least in our little world now you got to remember you know we're a small company so we've got you know several hundred doctors that are using our software as opposed to thousands across the country so we have a a pretty you know niche part of the market but they still tend to be very driven by that compliance uh, element we're finally we are starting to see customers ask for things our customers ask for things that their customers the patients kind of are requesting but but there's not been a lot of that I yeah. got it I gotta say and there's probably, probably largely because there's not a lot of opportunity where doctors solicit the wants or the needs of the patient because they're always trying to <laughs> that's trying to get patients in and out. Of yeah, it's kind of it's a that's an interesting point you brought up because the nature of the business itself, especially again in the sector we're dealing with, we're really talking about small practices, which in essence are small businesses, mm -hmm. right? So the doctors are the owners of a small business. But the, really the only way they make money and to allow themselves to stay in business is to see patients. So if they're not seeing patients individually, personally, then they're not making money. So the time you get with a doctor, either as a vendor or, even, or as a patient, it tends to be very limited because they've got to kind of get on to the next thing because the payment model says you do this service, you get paid this amount of money. So they're kind of by nature incented to do more volume. That prevents them from having the time to kind of examine their business. I would say it's a very trees-oriented business. They're in the trees all day long, yeah. and they have very little time to sit back and look at the forest and say, where do I want to go? You know. Now, that being said, the market itself is kind of <laughs> almost monolithically moving, right, because we, we went from this mode of paper and fax to a little bit of the data entry part. Now we're starting to see the sharing of data. So there's some standard formats that data is now moving from one provider to another and from the provider to the patient. So it's kind of evolving, not naturally, but it's kind of moving in a direction that allows the next step, step to happen. And I know we've talked previously, you've mentioned that doctors, even though they are, are small business owners, a lot of times didn't recognize that that was the case that's correct can there, you say a little bit about that yeah i think again i'm making some generalizations here but i would say generally you know doctors think of themselves as doctors not as business owners mm -hmm. where you know my previous um you know experiences in the restaurant industry so so a restaurateur who opens his own steakhouse or his italian restaurant he thinks of himself as a business person and says i've got a 
manage revenues. I've got to have those exceed costs. I've got to have labor efficiency. Doctors don't seem to have that that natural mentality as much, right? So they're very, you know, keen on seeing patients and diagnosing diseases mm-hmm. and creating treatment plans. That's correct, but they never they don't really think of themselves as as businesses. So I, I don't see a lot of things uh, that I would see in other businesses. Like how do I maximize my labor efficiency? Though they don't really kind of look at those things that often. Again, I think it goes back to that that notion that hey, I'm what I do is I see patients and use my medical knowledge and they, they don't have as much time for that yeah. the business side. It, it kind of makes sense. They spend 13 years or whatever studying health. Yeah. So as, and and it, not a lot of accounting classes or right. finance classes. No, in, in fact, in the, um, several of them have told me, you know, that now at least the, the medical students coming out of school now are, you know, are experiencing by, by their schooling the use of an electronic record but they don't get the accounting classes. They don't, and they don't get any of the basic accounting classes. And then the medical side is so complicated because it's not like I give you something and you pay me for it. I have to document what I did. I've got to send it to a third party. I've got to, so it's a very complicated environment that they don't get any schooling on. And their 13 years of specialized training kind of puts them in a category that's way different than and other professionals. You know, maybe a lawyer is the closest, but um, so it creates this dynamic that's kind of interesting. Yeah, that's interesting because I now that you you mentioned it, I don't think there's anybody that really gives the full picture. Because I know in my experience joining pharma, just learning how it all works was a huge uphill battle. Yes, um, the course. language is all different. Yeah. The components of the industry are different. And it again, it's all created it, itself, not only from the business side, but just from the marketing or the market side. It It's very fragmented. You know, I mean, you've got hospital inpatient environment versus an outpatient environment versus a clinical environment. And I often think about this now that I kind of understand the industry from that side. I think how confusing it must be to the average patient, let's call them, or the average consumer, because the terms are so technical for people in the industry to keep track of that, and they, and they get tossed around so frequently because the doctors have gone through so much training and they're very technically oriented from a medical standpoint. So I think that all contributes to kind of where we are today in a way, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. So Paul, continuing on the thread of doctors, what, what other challenges or what other unique characteristics do doctors have as, as okay. customers? So, <laughs> so a couple, and I think, again, this is interesting because we're at a certain point in time where a lot of our customers have been practicing medicine for, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years in a particular way, right, with the use of, of data, the use of documentation, the use of everything they do to, to think about how to do their job has been one way and it's been all based you know on our side all based around that paper medical chart so i've been i watched doctors a few years ago when we would transition them to paper to electronic and i saw that not only you know were they generally not very computer literate because they while the technology revolution was going on they were in medical school and doing their residency so they didn't get as much natural exposure to technology but in addition to that their thinking their medical thinking can goes along with how they're how they use that paper so i've often told a lot of our customers you're in the wrong place at the wrong time because you have to change because you've got to practice for 10 more years but it's messing up your whole thought pattern so it's 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 been a massive change now i think the next generation like i said coming out has more technology nativeness if i can call it that Mm -hmm. and they're you know they went to med school on the electronic records so their medical thinking is now going along with the you know the use of the electronic medical record right so there's been i I gotta say there's been a lot of resistance um you know from our our customers because they didn't really want to change you know which i kind of understand that but um you know they're they've kind of had to embrace this change so that's been a struggle so it's a big part of your job explaining and helping them understand what this whole new universe entails yeah. is that yes. fair yeah and and for the you know for the first you know and I started with IMED in 2009 right before you know again this big massive uh, investment by the government to get the transition to take place which has been successful right i mean 90% of hospitals are 
98% are on electronic records and 70 some odd percent of, of private practices. So I had to just explain to them the, the programs that were available or how to, I guess, leverage those programs to, in, in essence, to get the government to pay for their transition to electronic records. So that was a big thing just, just from there. And then we had to transition into, okay, how do you use this? And how do you operate your business using this? And we're only now after eight or 10 years starting to, as I said earlier, starting to say, now let's talk about how we can use this technology to make your business better. And they're still a little reluctant to, to believe that that's actually can happen. So yeah. there's, and I think there's a disconnect between what the doctors think the patients want and what the patients actually want. And the studies show that. Yeah. And that's true with any technological tra- change, right? It's- yeah. Most people don't see the other side of it. And they don't because, and again, this I think this business is in all those ways that you think it's even exaggerated further because of the things we talked about earlier. So I, I do think there's an opportunity now. We're at a, if, if we kind of transition to where we're at and what's happening next, I do think we're on the, on, on the brink of a, of a much bigger turning point, I think, and I hope in that the technology will now start to drive the, the mechanics of the business, which it, it was definitely not doing that before. You know, the, the technology was a requirement for the business that was kind of thrust upon them. In fact, many of them thought it was a government requirement, which it really wasn't. It was a voluntary incentive program. But it's now going to start to drive the mechanics of the business, and I think that will be a very good thing uh, for all parties, all stakeholders. So let's transition then to kind of a macro view of things. So you explain how you operate within Louisiana and then maybe give some of the broader players. Sure, sure. All right. So as I said, we're a small company. We, you know, I don't know if the word boutique is right or whatever. I always say we're kind of a first name basis, hug you when we see you type of company, right? So our customers are very um, close to us and we're very close to our customers. And you know, 10 or 12 years ago, the market was pretty, I'll call it stable from a, from a business makeup standpoint, you had your, you know, your hospitals, and then on the larger end, you had your full health systems. And then you had a big market of independent practitioners. There's been a big shift to those uh, hospitals and health systems, buying and then employing those physicians so that the networks, I think, are becoming bigger. That allowed major vendors like Cerner and Epic and so forth to come in and make really large sales to a big group of people. Um, So that that dynamics changed a a little bit, but we still we still see a uh, a strong segment of the market might be smaller now. That's the independent practitioner. And to some degree, they're banding together through accountable care organizations to engage in some programs that I think are good for the patients and good for the practices as well. Comparing IMED or IMED Core to Epic or Cerner, what's some of the biggest differences? Would you say? You, you mean from an actual product standpoint? Yeah, product or, or just company offerings. Or yeah, anything? it's interesting. We de- we debate that a lot. You know, mm-hmm. in a, in our little company, our exposure to the big companies is to some degree through uh, you know people who are using it or have been using that and come to use our system. But as a small company, we don't have a huge marketing budget, so we don't do a lot of you know traditional market research. We don't we quite frankly don't do a lot of you know outbound marketing in general. So. What I know about other vendors oftentimes is from the website, right, their websites. But to us, it looks like the technology piece, even though we're a small company with an R&D budget that's, you know, a fraction of the size of an Epic, we're able to um, deliver comparable, I think, functionality, you know, to to the um, to the customer base. Um, you know, there are some disadvantages to being small, certainly. You know, we, don't, we can't do everything we want to do as quickly as we can. But I think the advantages are that we can, we can be closer to the customer. So the result of what we deliver, I think, is executed uh, a lot better. And I'm not sure if I answered yeah, your question yeah, yeah. or not. But. And it's, I, I guess where, what I was thinking, I wanted to verify, it's not a David versus Goliath type of situation. Well, Yes and, no. yes and no, yeah, right? right? Because I think again, we can, you know, the, the in this business, unlike other businesses, as a small vendor, we have the same uh, what I'll, what's called certification requirements. So we have some regulatory requirements that we have to go through. That's a little more challenging for a small company 
to not not only because they charge us money to be certified, but because you have to develop to a, spe- a specific standard. So I think that puts us at a little bit of the David side and the Goliaths can do that better. Um, but on the other hand, I think there's an opportunity for us to get into a part of the market that's harder for the bigger vendors to do as well. And from a product standpoint, do you find you're able to be more nimble? Yes, I, I think in in certain areas. Again, in certain areas, I think I think it's it, and this may be a biased view, but I I view that the bigger vendors can check the boxes of of certain functionality a little bit easier because they can throw bodies at it. But in terms of delivering uh, that, that's very some pretty sophisticated stuff because it's an operational workflow. It's not like an accounting system that's just transactional based. So I think they can check those boxes. But I think we as a small company are more nimble in the fact that we deliver a piece of software. And we literally, Glenn, who's the, you referenced him earlier, Glenn Jimenville, the CEO, will go out into the into the clinic with the doctors and say, well, how does that work? And they go, well, if this was over here and this did that, we go back in a week later, it's like, that's what you meant? So we're able to really be nimble from that perspective. And so so as we've kind of engaged with certain payers and we're, we're doing some programs for the payers, they'll often tell us, man, you guys are way ahead of of where everyone else is because you're doing this and you're able to do that and you you can engage with us in this way. So when you talk to our company, you're talking to the to the top level you know, there's no layers in between, you know, the person who answers the phone and the CEO. So that provides us a huge advantage. And does it really just come down to decision making on what priorities you want to focus on? Because that, yeah, that's always tough. I mean, that, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about, you know, Glenn and I sat down one time, I had just read the Steve Jobs biography, like a lot of people did. And the thing that caught me is he said, every year they put a hundred things on the board and the, the most the reason he's most successful is he's able to erase 97 of them, right? We still have trouble erasing 97 of them. So we, we, we've gotten a lot better, but it's, it is hard to, to decide what to do next. You know, again, for a while that, that interestingly, the regulatory side helped us do that because we had a list of 39 things that you had to do. So it's like, well, that was good because it gave us the direction, but it was kind of bad because then you ended up with, this list of stuff that someone said was needed, but maybe wasn't the right thing. And do you have, do you find it difficult? I'm sure not all your customers ask for exactly the same thing. How do you balance kind of keeping the customer happy when you're getting a thousand requests a day? The thing the, again, I'm going to go back to the thing. We don't get a thousand requests yeah. a day. Okay. Yeah. We, there, another, another Steve Jobs thing that we kind of say is we're going to, we're going to give the customer what they need, even though they don't know what they want. I think is how it goes, right? Something like so that. So yep. we're able to observe what's going on both with our customer base as well as the bigger industry. And again, we're having some conversations with payers, which which are a big driver, obviously. You know, and the pay, the payers know what they want and need, so we can kind of be in between the payer and the provider and help uh, broker or negotiate them. In this case, the movement of data to support better outcomes, right? So <laughs> that side has been, you know. D- Fielding requests and trying to prioritize them has not been as big a problem for us as saying, okay, no one's asking us specifically for something. What should we do that will allow our current customer base to to be as effective as possible, but also to, for us to attract new customers? Given that, we've got the, the, the Goliaths out there, yeah. right? So when you got these major health systems, you really – Again, it's a it's a blessing and a curse because when, when there's these big opportunities, we don't have to spend any money on those because the big players are in there, you know, uh, offering this unified system or whatever, which is a little bit of a misnomer. So we have a certain market we go after, and it gives us a little clarity there. Makes sense. Makes sense. So from a uh, IMED as a company perspective, what's what's your current priorities, or what are you looking to to focus on in the next three to five years? Okay, so. I guess twofold. One, you know, we've now separated, we, we started, we've now started using this word traditional medicine or traditional, I don't know, just the word traditional to say, you know, our current customer base who are practices that, that have been in business 5, 10, 15, 20 years, kind of in the same way, they're doing the same thing. So we need to keep delivering for them things that allow them to, to make, you know, remain relevant and, and do the things they need to do. But the other 
the focus we've had now is to say we, we think it's very difficult for that traditional environment to really embrace the radical change that's needed to transform how care is delivered, okay? So what we think will be better and where we're focusing some energy now is to create a delivery mechanism, a new business that uses the technology as the driver and brings the medical, you know, licensed care in behind it, if that makes sense. So, you know, the because of a lot of the things we've talked about, it's hard for those current businesses to really change. And I we think that the technology will allow the care delivery to, to transform as much as Netflix transformed, you know, video streaming and, and you know, the blockbusters of the world kind of went away pretty quickly because they were they were usurped by something that's a little bit better so we're trying to trying to take our technology base and say let's let's design the care delivery that would make the most sense for the patient and staff it with with medical professionals who are a little more innovative that aren't encumbered by their current business model and this is IMED, this not, is, not the industry as a whole. Right. This is IMED doing this. Now, I think that I think that transformation is going to happen across the industry in various different ways. I think some of the traditional players will start to migrate that way. And you've seen, you know, the CVS and Aetna merger and and Amazon and and um, Berkshire, Berkshire and there. So I think we'll have some players coming in from the outside. And I think some of the traditional guys will will migrate. But in again, in our little part of the world, we said to ourselves, if we can go all out and offer an environment where we where we can provide the the customer, the patient, with a better experience at at a more convenient and efficient and um, you know accessible and transparent and cost effective way, then that will be good for the industry so we're gonna we're gonna kind of pursue that as a kind of adjunct to our core technology business so explain that a little bit more what does that look like in practice and how does it differ from what's currently done okay so you know currently i would say that in in general again some things are changing in various little pockets here but in general you know the traditional care uh delivery is is very reactive and it's very episodic right and there is some talk of chronic care management and all that, but generally speaking, patients engage with the the industry in a very traditional way. They make an appointment, they go see the doctor, and they, they do something, and they're kind of off on their own until the next visit. So where we see it changing is, is kind of the reverse of that, to become very proactive, very consistently engaging, very technologically engaging with the patient. So you have a trying to find the right word, but you have a health coach or a health advocate who kind of their sole job is to have a population of patients that they're proactively caring for and touching on a regular basis so that, you know, you, I, a, I say this a lot, your health care management should be very analogous to how you do your financial management. You know, you don't just check your checkbook balance once every quarter. You're checking your online statement every day, doing little things, and then you're truing up every month, and then you're doing your taxes once a year, right? So we see a, a an annual event where you say, okay, let's chart the course for the next 12 months. What are our goals here? And then our advocates will be hitting you with app-based reminders or whatever the case may be. You'll have access to engagement so that you can continually create what we call a health style, right? And I, th I think a good analogy for me is if you look at the – automotive industry what tesla i don't have a tesla yet all right, right. it's coming yeah, right right it's on i today. hope yeah. um but if you think about my vehicle i drive a chevy i mm -hmm. take it to the shop when something goes wrong right. tesla they alert you when something's going yeah. to go wrong and come to you or or you bring it to them it's yeah and, and you know that's it that is a good analogy because that again that you know you can use the technology buzzwords the predictive analytics the artistic uh, you know artificial intelligence the machine learning all that's designed to kind of manage things incrementally in advance rather than massively in arrears, right? right. And, that, and again, you look at the payers, that's all what they're trying to do is figure out how do we spend more or different money on the front end to avoid the back end stuff. And that's what Tesla is doing is they don't want you to be hit with a $400 mechanic bill. So, you, you know, you whether it's, you know, paid money or whatever, you're, you're incrementally keeping things tuned up so that you don't have problems down the road. I think the 
the important piece is you have to have some way to measure it right. without physically interacting with the doctor. I think you touched on it, yeah. but that's that's a big piece of it, right? You oh, don't yeah. have to fact, physically go to the doctor. In fact, you, uh, virtual is is definitely the key to this and and data i mean surely data is is key in fact we're going the whole imed management team is going to the consumer electronics show next week because you know on our side if you want to think about that we have the technology reservoir where all this data is coming in and it's moving around but you know that the evolution that's happening now are these wearables and various things to to collect the data at the patient side deliver it automatically, have the machines crunch that information like Tesla does, I'm sure. They're getting data from that car. They're running it through some algorithm and saying, okay, this is what I need to do. So if we can start doing that for a patient and work health, you know, health, healthy styles into their daily lives in a, in a non-intrusive way, that's going to be key, right? So collecting that data, crunching it, doing things with it, I think that's important, but the, the other thing about healthcare, it's a very personal business. So even though the technology is going to be very important, the consumer has to have a relationship with the person on the other side. That's why we're very, very um, clear that this is medical, licensed, professional-based technology and people so that the consumer has a credible resource on the other side and, yeah. and can start leveraging that it's it's almost surely the most personal industry there is because it it's your body I, and, yes i and, mean there's nothing more personal yeah and the last right? thing people want is to just be a number on a chart right right yeah well you, you know you, you're right it's the most personal but i think i i used the financial um you know analogy earlier that's a pretty personal thing too so your accountant if you're a small business owner like i am you you know that accountant relationship is very very key you know, an, another one I think about is, uh, you know, a, a hairdresser for a woman. They, they establish these relationships and the, the people know you and the health care need that the, your health advocate needs to be that intimate with you. And you got to trust them. So now the interesting thing is that technology can be used to enhance the trust, whereas I think generations pre previous to us thought the technology was impersonal. I think that the generations now are saying, hey, I can have a very personal relationship that's driven through technology. So I think if we marry that with, with, the, with the healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. I think we'll be in good shape. Yeah. You don't have a deep personal relationship with your hairdresser? Let's take a look here. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not for about 20 years, yeah. actually. <laughs> so so um, with this initiative, where are you at? Is it just starting? Is that... We're in... We're in um, we're in pro, uh, we're about to open even though it's going to be virtual based right we do believe that that storefronts are an important piece too because there are some physical elements so we're about to open our first clinic that will you know be the storefront but but um will be the enabler for the subscription base it's going to be a subscription based program so if you engage in what we're calling sync healthcare you will you will get a subscription service that's allows you access to the care uh, on a continual basis. So we're going to, we're looking at first quarter of this year might be, you know, April might spill into second quarter where we'll, um, we'll open the first location and assemble our first set of subscribers. And those will be consumers off, off this, you know, an individual, but it's also, you know, there's a big, um, a big shift in, well, not a shift, but there's a big part of the market that you have these mid-sized companies, smaller mid-sized companies that are self-insured. So they can actually um, offer the subscription to their employees, use that, spend that money to reduce their back end money. So we think that it's going to grow pretty rapidly because we can, we can, you know, kind of add a couple companies and that'll, that'll give three, five, six hundred, you know, lives or whatever that'll be covered under this subscription care. And so you're really interacting with pretty much everyone across healthcare or a good portion of the healthcare industry. With yeah, this we will because, you know, a lot of, you know, the, the, the model we have is definitely based on prevention and wellness. Okay. But there's a management element to it that that's so key because we talked about earlier how confusing the, the, the industry can be. So just having that advocate to say, this is my situation. What should I do? I mean, what other business is there where the same service can cost a hundred dollars at one place and two thousand dollars at another right and that's the case with well, maybe not a hundred dollars but a couple hundred dollars for an mri versus fifteen hundred so our advocates will also help our consumers 
kind of manage the 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 Just navigate navigate yeah mm-hmm. navigate through the traditional healthcare. So that's going to be all kind of specialties, uh, all kinds of facilities and environments, mm-hmm. just to try to help, you know, just, I know you're on the pharma side, but just, just to figure out how to get the medicines you need yeah. at the, at, at the lowest out-of-pocket cost for yourself is non-trivial. And I think a lot of people don't know certain things exist and they end up paying a lot more money. And then if they have to pay more money, they don't, they don't adhere to the therapy. So that creates its own problems. So I think we're going to, we're going to be touching into a lot of areas. Now, the timing's right because the data can move now, right? The, the providers aren't all doing it effectively, but the data can move, and so a, a business can be efficient in that management process. Yeah, and how did the how did, so this is the first time you'll be inter, interacting or at least closer to the patient than you've ever Correct. been? Correct. We, our business currently, you know, our, our traditional business is our customers are the doctors, right? So we're, and, and their staff. But, so this will be the first time where we'll be delivering a, you know, a consumer, I guess, product, if mm-hmm. you want to call it that, yeah. right? So that's, that's a big, that's a big shift for us, right? But again, I think the, the, the stars have aligned to the point where the, the kind of things that a business delivering medical care needs are more consistent with the traditional business, not a medical business, right? You've got to pay attention to customer service, response times, you know, uh, customer satisfaction. What are you delivering them something that's of value to them? And, and the, the market needs that. Right. And so that's what, that's where we plan to spend our focus, focus our energy. Great. Any closing thoughts with IMED that you can think of? Well, you know, I, I, I think the, the thing I would say, the only thing I would say is that we've been doing this 20 years and I'm more excited about the next 20 than the last 20 because I think really, you know, Glenn always said he, he got into this business to change how things are done. Mm-hmm. And he's said to me many times over the last 10 years, he goes, man, I thought we'd be a lot farther than we are now. Not not we, I met, but we, the industry. And I think, you know, we're finally in these last six or 12 months when we've been planning the sync healthcare, we said, this is the thing. I think we can do to del- change the experience for the for the patient and make it better. I mean, we, we don't want to call them a patient, you know, because that means you're sick. So right. I don't know, a patient. We've debated we need a better that, word but, for it. <laughs> yeah, we need a better we need a better word for a lot right. of things in this industry. But mm-hmm. but I think we we finally feel like there's an opportunity here for you know for the for the industry as a whole and for us as a, the little player in it to to make a change. You That's know, great. To, yeah, to, and I think it's it's awesome how you've taken your relationships and the insight you've gotten from those and really hit home on a couple of the key pain points that I mean yeah. everyone me included has probably gotten a doctor bill and tried to decipher what, what it, it is. what it says and right think and for the Brian for the majority of the people once that happens the next time they say no I'm not right you know so they don't engage right yeah. so they either over engage or don't engage and and so the good news is the bad news is there's a lot of problems the good news is there's a lot of problems so we yeah. can fix them and <laughs> The, the stars are aligning, I think, so that we can, we as IMED and the industry as a whole can start really changing how we do things to, to create some efficiency. And we've been talking about, you know, the patients and, and the need for it in that arena there is. But, I mean, just the financial, from a, from a society and economy standpoint, you know, 20 cents of every dollar almost is spent on health care now. And it's totally unsustainable. So we have to fix it, not only from a, from a health care and a, quality of life standpoint but from a financial economic standpoint it's got to be fixed yeah, so it has to so i think i think there it's going to happen i yep. think it's going to happen over the next five five years or so i i think i met will be a part of helping it happen and yep. i'm excited about uh about doing that that's great yeah and i'll include in the show notes the link to your guys website and so awesome. if folks want to go and, and research a little bit more about i met cool company and a lot good story behind it and then obviously they're doing a lot of cool things uh in the future all right so let's transition so steve and i both read the book bad blood and i think anyone in the healthcare industry should check it out because it i think it high at least for me it highlighted a lot of the a lot of the difficulties in healthcare Mm -hmm. that it's not as easy as people make it out to as maybe you read in the media or If you just look at things on face value, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes. Um, so there will be spoiler alerts. So if you haven't read the book and want to, um, feel free to hit pause and come back after you've read it. 
Um, but for those that don't know, Bad Blood, it's about Elizabeth Holmes uh, and Theranos out in Silicon Valley. They were a blood testing blood testing device company. Right. And they wanted the their goal was to test a whole plethora of tests within one small tiny device with a small prick of blood. That's how the company originated. And um I, I, they're still around, so they're not they haven't completely bombed out, but they definitely were hyped and had multi billion dollar valuation uh and then without they had that valuation without actually delivering anything. And so, um, I guess the the big thing that kind of jumped out for me is that how you structure your company in the healthcare and the environment and culture you create has such a huge impact on how the company delivers. Because it it with those two they with the two Sonny and Elizabeth the way they structured the company um, they made it very siloed. They had a lot of people not talking to each other. Um, they didn't focus on reality. They kind of had this pie in the sky vision and let that drive them and it it ultimately just gave the the book highlights it well that the individual contributors or employees were driven mad trying to navigate around that culture and environment that right. that those two set up. Yeah, and I think you you mentioned it, when we were talking about the you know the mix or match or or oil and water in a way of healthcare in Silicon Valley because that that Theranos, is that how we decide I think so. we're going to yeah. pronounce it? Theranos, you know, tried to combine those two things. And on the Silicon Valley side, you've got that, you know, innovative test and pivot and change and hype and try to deliver what you say after you say it and all that. But the, the healthcare industry at being that intimate and very dangerous environment on the other side is is not very conducive to that right it's highly regulated and you can't just do things you know cutting a corner because that will that has lives at stake right i always used to say i'm you know i used to deal with restaurants a lot so if i delivered a hamburger instead of a chicken salad because the computer told me the wrong thing no harm no foul right you deliver a bad test result here and people are going to go either do things or not do things based on that so i think i think that was a, a big piece for me too is that you can't quite build a healthcare industry uh, healthcare technology company like you build an uber or yeah. uh, instagram or something you know yeah not definitely not exactly right and i think it's important to highlight at least for me elizabeth the the ceo and founder she's an anomaly um, yeah. most you know you need a strategy and a vision but it has to that has to be a small sliver of it you have to test and validate what you're trying to do sure yeah, it, it, it wasn't. There wasn't a lot of that. It was ninety percent vision and strategy, and then ten percent actual. Yeah, practical. I think it's. It seemed to me they got caught up in, in as you said, ignoring the reality, and then creating ways to cover the igno- ig- ignoring of that reality. Right. So they wanted the the result to follow the vision, but it didn't. It didn't get there. And healthcare, you gotta you you you've got things you have to adhere to. There are non optional. Right. 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 So, and I, the other thing it, that jumped out to me is how I, I, it's obvious when you step back, but it maybe not so obvious when you're actually in the thick of it is how cross-functional the healthcare industry is. If you think about retail, marketing's completely separate from sales. You don't right. really need those to interact. All the domains that blend together to create a healthcare offering or a healthcare company, they have to be. Comp- pretty well intertwined yeah. maybe not completely intertwined but if you don't do that you lose so much value because you have to transfer the data transfer the knowledge yeah. it's a it's one big process that you're working through and well and the each each side you're re- very right on that but you know each component of that has a level of of technical expertise that's not really found i mean if you're build if you're you know creating apparel you need to you know the person sewing the thing needs to know how to sew and all that but in some of the <clears throat> things in that business we, they were talking about you got you know chemical phd level kind of stuff going on and you've got uh, other other very technical components that have to come together and if they if one misses from the other the whole thing is shot you that's know? right yeah so yeah and it when <laughs> that was what was so interesting about the book is they kept missing and not right. delivering but they didn't really recognize that right. alternate reality that you exactly. mentioned. Exactly, exactly. Um, I guess one of the other things, too, is how critically important 
it is to be very conscious of what organization you join because as if you're in a leadership position, I guess you have more influence um, over kind of the environment or culture you create. But as an individual contributor, there was countless individuals in the book that didn't agree with the way things were going or right. didn't like the progress that was being made or the approach that they took. But they really couldn't do anything right. because they weren't one of those those management I mean, de- folks. definitely culture and any, you know, philosophy and culture in any business is top down for sure. So as you said, as a leader, you can, you can kind of set that direction, but as an employee, you you, you almost, there's no choice. You have to abide by the culture that exists at the company you're at. So you better find a good match between, you know, the culture and the philosophy you have individually and that of the organism, because it's hard to change that from the bottom up. Yeah. And that, that was an extreme example in, in bad blood, but it's, it's true in any, in any case. Yeah. That business takes on the culture of the leader, and it's extremely difficult to change that. So do you, you mentioned Silicon Valley. I, that was another takeaway for me is just how different that, that stratosphere operates from the rest of the yeah. world. Yeah. Um, I, I, it seems like for the past 10 years, folks have been talking about healthcare getting disrupted. I guess, does, is there any... I guess what's your thoughts on why that's difficult and yeah. why it hasn't happened? Because there's countless well, examples like yeah. the Google Lens is the latest one that yeah. where they tried to monitor the insulin levels with with a contact lens and it bombed out. Yeah, I, you know, there, there's probably a, a lot of reasons, right? But but I do actually believe it is peaked for disruption now. But and I think to me the the biggest reason it couldn't happen prior is you know, one of the another big buzzword in the industry is interoperability, and I'm not sure what people connotate when they hear that. But the data was not being recorded for many years, so you couldn't you couldn't disrupt. You have no data to know what to do with. Mm-hmm. Now the data is being recorded, at least in a structured and standardized way, although not quite fully yet. But it hasn't been liberated yet. But now we're starting to see the data move. So you know, you can't you can't really transform something unless you have a good picture of what the current environment is and without data you don't know that Mm -hmm. right now in theranos case that was a very you know specific area of blood testing and i think the life sciences whether it's blood testing imaging and you know uh pharmaceutical therapies and all that that's kind of going along but but how to utilize that to actually change behavior on the consumer side that's where the disruption is going to take place the wearables are going to help with that, but the the data was needed, yeah. and I think lack yeah. of data means you can't you you can't make big money <laughs> because you don't have the data to right. go after, right? So you can't make smart yeah. decisions. Yeah, yeah right, right. I mean, Instagram and that couldn't have really gotten to where it was without the the you know the technology of the cell phones being in everyone's hands, so that you could move those pictures back and forth very easily. So I think that's going to start to happen now with healthcare. Yeah, it's interesting the Silicon Valley because I. It seems like Apple and some of the other Amazon, they're making moves to kind of position themselves for healthcare, but it's still, it's still a bit unclear in my mind whether they're actually going to go. Whether it's quite there yet. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> There's been a couple starts and stops of those big guys over the years, and I, my, my little simplistic view is they kind of took a look at it and said, no, it's not ready yet. You know, it's not soup yet. Yeah. There's not enough efficiency to gain here. I think you know with. Um, Apple Health now being integrated into the iOS or however that is, and Google doing some things. I think it's going to happen now. Again, to me, it comes back to that data, right? Now we still have. I mean, the health the the health industry is so data heavy. Mm-hmm. I mean, in financials, you got the dollars and the debits and the credits and whatever. But in healthcare, you got blood lab lab levels. You got imaging values. You've got yeah. you know BMI. You got all these data points. I think all the data is now starting to become structured enough that the machines can can work with it. Yeah, it can surface and, it and tell the story. Exactly. Right? And mm-hmm. utilize it to do something proactively. Yeah, in a meaningful way. And, yeah. And I and and then that when that's delivered to the consumer in a convenient way, then I mean just take the take the little Fitbit I'm wearing here, right? I can now track my steps and I can make changes to my behavior because I'm very easily I can say, oh, I don't have ten thousand steps yet. So if I can do that same kind of thing with my glucose level or my, you know, my blood pressure reading or, you know, the new uh, Apple Watch has the ECG, so it kind of is monitoring my heart. So now I can, as a consumer, consume that data in a friendly way. 
I think that's what allows the big guys to come in and say, right. okay, we can deliver to multi-millions of people these kinds of things that will change their lives. Yeah, and I think it the that's one end of the spectrum. The other end is what's holding them back, right? And that's right. the regulatory aspect. Yeah. That's a completely different world for them. Right. And also just the high importance of quality because you're dealing with human bodies yeah. rather than you can't make mistakes right. but i think tesla is another good example there because you know driverless vehicles are the same way they cannot make a mistake so you can't have buggy software right, right? so you got to be really ready when you're going to get into healthcare yeah. because uh any any not a misstep even but any um hole in your in your componentry it, it costs lives so you can't just you can't just do it. So it's got to move slow. Unfortunately, it's it's weird to me on the on the traditional side, you know, over the years because of that regulation, because it's so slow moving on the Silicon Valley side. It's, hey, let's let's, you know, have a vision and we'll we'll fill the vision in as we go. That's kind of too risky. The middle ground is hard to get at. Yeah. Right. And it seems like you think about Apple introducing the EKG in their watches. Maybe that's how it happens too. It could just be that incremental I think it's slowly but that. surely yeah. Apple offers some right. more offerings through their phone yeah. or device. Well I think it's it, again I keep using the analogy of the driverless vehicle because now, you know, everyone says a oh, driverless vehicle. There's that I I can't really imagine that. But if you buy a car today it's got the lane you know, yeah. the lane thing and the auto parking. Yeah. So we're kind of incrementally moving there. It's, anyway. it's happening I mean, without yeah, a lot of... It's happening without us really knowing that. I mean, again, think about the cell phone. We, you know, it's tw over 12 years time. You went from flipping open a phone and kind of making a call and using the numbers and all that. Now we're like just, you, you pop it open. Well, that, that happened incrementally, yeah. just very rapidly, right? Yeah. So I, I do think we're gonna we're gonna hit a hockey stick to some degree in the in the healthcare industry. There you go, Silicon it, Valley hockey stick. Yeah, it's gonna be the <laughs> hockey stick. But but as consumers, we're not. It's not gonna be one day we wake up and go, wow, things are different. Yeah, we're just gonna incrementally kind of have access yeah. to more to more things. Yeah, and I think it's happening. That's yeah. that's the most exciting thing for me because I, if you think about healthcare. I came into it at a perfect time when it started to change, right. and it, it, when you step back, it's so obvious that it's inefficient in so many right. areas. And I think the way we fix it is through technology. I agree. I think that's. And I'll make one final, one other point on that: is this as healthcare? I think more than any other business potentially is is very generationally um, significant, right? So each generation brings a significantly different perspective. To healthcare, to all businesses, but mm -hmm. but healthcare in particular, because you know, like my generation is seeing parents that lived longer, and that either lived a good quality of life for the last few years or not so good quality. Your generation is seeing mine make decisions. You're more technology enabled, and you're 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 more wanting that convenience. Where I don't really want all that change, right? So I think your generation is going to be the one that's really going to move this forward because you're going to say, "Hey, I can't put up with this. I can make my appointment for this online. I can do that. I get a notification here, and I, you're saying I got to make a phone call to you to, to make an <laughs> appointment." I, so your generation isn't gonna isn't gonna stand for it, yeah. right? And you want to be healthier, I think. You want to avoid those chronic conditions that you've seen other people, yep. other generations have to deal with. Yeah, right? I think that's a great note to end on. Thanks so much for doing this, Steve. Right. Appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. We're uh, we'll head back to the buffet line now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> go uh, go snorkel with the stingrays next. Yep, right? that's right. Thanks, All everyone. Right. Thank you.